All right, guys, welcome back to the video. So in this one, we're going to be doing a project that is a little bit on the interesting side and breaks some of my kind of fundamental rules when it comes to woodworking. So ever since I got into woodworking, I very adamantly said that you should never paint or stain wood. And this has kind of been my rule for the past few years that I've been doing this nice woodworking. And to a certain extent, that is still my rule with most woods. You know, woods like white oak and walnut really don't need to be stained or painted or anything like that because they already look really good. But in the case of this project, my idea here was to use a wood, very specifically a wood like ash that has very open porous grain, combining that with a little bit of paint to then create something that is a little bit more interesting. Because one of the things that I'm finding is that there's only so much walnut, white oak, and cherry furniture that you can have in a house before it starts to get a little bit tacky. So recently I've been trying to mess around with different combinations in that, trying some new stuff, and overall just trying to do a little bit more experimenting. Now, obviously the idea of painting wood is not a new idea. The Shakers did it all the way, you know, back in those days and have that really traditional furniture, they, you know, they would paint over their hand cut joinery and all that. It's not a new technique by any stretch of the imagination, but nowadays when we talk about painting wood, it just brings to mind these horrible DIY jobs of people taking furniture from back alleys, throwing a coat of paint over it and calling it fine furniture or just furniture in general. And that's not what I'm going for here. I'm not going for that painted, furniture look, I'm going for a very nice quality piece. So this took a lot of testing to finally figure out a combination of wood, paint, and finish that all works together to create the look that I want. And I'll admit here right at the beginning of the video that this, it did not go particularly well. You know, the finish and all that did come out just fine, but it's not quite where I want it to be. And I do have some ideas for the future to improve it, but we'll talk about that as we go through the video here. Anyway, this project in itself is overall a pretty simple one, and that's very important anytime you're trying out a new technique, you want to find a project that's fairly simple, but is also going to give you kind of a good uh, area to test out whatever new technique. The other important thing here, as you can see in these next few clips, is that I actually did learn something from the last project. If you guys watched the side cabinet video in that project where we did these floating panels where I added them afterwards with a little bit, you know, the same way you'd add in a glass panel, one of the big mistakes I made is I didn't square up the corners of the rabbits. Well, on this project, I luckily enough remembered that lesson, went back in and remembered to square up the corners of my rabbits. And I think that this is a really important point to mention because I always say that the best way to learn anything in woodworking is by doing it in a project. I think that, especially on YouTube, a lot of people just get stuck in the mindset of doing test pieces, practicing joinery, you know, all oh, leaders my, you know, 30 attempts at cutting a dovetail joint. And that's never going to help you learn anything. The, be the single best way to learn anything in woodworking is by figuring out what you want to do and then trying to incorporate that into a project. So the other part of this project that is a kind of a big experiment for me is that this is a type of cabinet that I still don't fully understand. Now, now that I actually have it built, it makes a little bit more sense, but before I started building it, I still didn't fully understand how the whole structure and weight distribution, all that worked. So most of the cabinets that I've built, well, I should say all the cabinets that I've built have all been a panel design where you have a solid outer carcass and you usually connect them by dovetails. You can use box joints, whatever. And that is your solid structure. Whereas this one, this, the way that this cabinet is built is it's built the same way that I've built a lot of my floor standing cabinetry. So it's built up with this mortise and tenon joiner in the frames. We've got these really strong bevels for our corners and we're creating this whole structure out of this frame joinery. So it's a much, much different style of cabinet compared to any of the other stuff that I built before. And I can fully admit that I, I was very skeptical of it actually working. So I did design it so that it could be a, you know, a, a desktop sitting cabinet. You know, you could just leave it sitting on a desk or on a side table, whatever, something like that. But it does have the option to hang. So this has now kind of become standard practice in my woodworking. When I sit down to design a project, I always try to think about, you know, what techniques do I want to try out? What techniques do I want to learn? Or what techniques do I want to practice? Because there's so many different things in woodworking where I've tried it like one time or I've thought about trying it, but never actually tried it. So if I design a project specifically around trying out a certain technique or a couple techniques, then that actually gives me the ability to just get that project over with and figure out what I'm doing. Then I can again incorporate those into later projects and hopefully have a better idea of what I'm doing. Now, a lot of the techniques that I'm using in this project are fairly rough. This being the first time I've ever used any kind of water-based finish on wood, it, you know, it took a lot of time to figure out what I was doing and trying to get the great results. 
Same thing, this whole cabinet. This took a lot of time sitting there in SketchUp trying to figure out how I was going to make sure I was transferring the weight and the stress that this cabinet was going to hold eventually, making sure I was transferring it all properly to a back panel. And that's where the whole, that, that was the most complicated part of the design of this thing. The other part of this is I want to try and make the project as simple as possible. So you can see here that we have a, just an open frame. It's very easy to work in, but all of our main components on the outside are all just one solid frame. And then all of the internal stuff is going to be added onto that frame afterwards. Again, this goes back to a lot of the lessons that I've learned lately is that not everything has to be, you know, fully traditional joinery. You don't have to use sliding dovetails or true mortise and tenon joinery all this kind of stuff. You can break and bend the rules in order to make your life a little bit easier. That is some of the nice things we have with our modern technology in that. So these first pieces that we're gonna be adding into the internal section here are the cross pieces. Now these pieces I changed very last minute in the project because I had this really interesting idea that I thought would work out really well and in it kind of worked, but also kind of didn't. So the idea here is that I wanted to be able to put in these pieces, I wanted to have these tenons exposed on these pieces and have them unpainted while everything else on this cabinet was painted. So the way that I figured out I could do that is if I just cut those through mortises into our stretcher pieces and then I cut these round dowel holes into our cross pieces, what I could do is I could make up some custom little dowels that on the lathe that had one square end and one rounded end that fit perfectly into these holes. That would then allow me to then add these pieces in after the whole glue up and all that once everything was painted and you'd get that nice look of these through tenon pieces that were just raw natural wood. Now onto the moment we've all been waiting for, the first painting session. So for the paint color, I couldn't find one that I liked, so I ended up just mixing together this green and black uh, paint from Home Depot. Now this is just a standard latex paint, because in my testing, I found that this was just the easiest option. Uh, the two little tester jars that I bought cost five bucks each, not expensive at all compared to like milk paint, and I could go through and apply it with the airbrush. Now the airbrush is the most important part of this because what the airbrush does is it puts on such a light coat of paint that it just kind of, it has that time to soak into the wood. And so with the extremely porous nature of ash, as the paint soaks into the wood, you get to keep all of that beautiful grain structure and texture visible through the paint. Now, one of the things that I think is very important to mention here is that this is my first time ever working with any kind of water-based finish, paint, whatever. Uh, I've done a little bit with milk paint, which is water-based, but not, not enough to really know the ins and outs of it. This project was overall fairly complex and fairly detailed, so seeing how a water-based finish acts all across the whole thing here uh, was very interesting. So what I'm top coating this with is a water-based varnish uh, that was not meant to be sprayed, but I was able to thin it down enough to make it spray pretty nicely. And so overall, the results with this varnish were okay. I'm not going to insult the product too much because there's a very good chance I wasn't using it correctly. In fact, there's a pretty good chance of that. Uh, but overall, I wasn't, I can't say that this is going to be my new technique for finishing projects. Now that we've got everything painted and a coat of finish on it, it's we're ready to move on to our second stage glue up here. So we're going to be gluing in our cross pieces. And like I said before, in order to do that, we're going to be adding in these strange little dowel pins. So I'm just starting by making a whole bunch of square cherry pieces that fit into the mortises that I cut onto the front stretchers. Then I can put the pieces into the lathe and turn a small dowel section and use my Veritas dowel forming pieces uh, to make sure that the dowel section is the perfect size. So when I was making the square pieces, I just made sure to leave it slightly oversized. Then I'm just using my hand plane held in my moxin vise here to just tune them up so that they are a perfect fit into those mortises. I want these to be as gap free as possible. Nicely enough, because the wood is dark, it's very easy to hide any small gaps, but I still wanted to make them as tight a fit as possible. So then once I had them fitted up, then I could go through and shape them. So on our front pieces, I'm going through and adding in this bevel to all four edges, and then we're going to go through and add some water-based stain to them. Now these plugs are the perfect example of overthinking because what I was trying to mimic here was green and green style joinery. But the big difference here is that in green and green style joinery, you rely a lot on mechanical fasteners or screws to hold your pieces together and then you're just putting a plug in over top. Now in hindsight, that makes a heck of a lot more sense than what I tried to do here because the problem that I ran into is I just incorporated a whole bunch of glue into these nicely finished pieces and then that spilled out everywhere and just kind of made a mess. But in the end, everything worked out just fine. And I have to say, I absolutely love this technique and this look. I just, I'm looking forward to doing it better in a future project. Onto our dividers now. This is another really cool thing I got to try out with this project. And that is making it so that I can add in my dividers after the whole project has been glued up and is, you know, the whole structure is together. Because as you guys have already seen, we have that whole structure that's already been painted, already put it assembled and put together. Now we're going to go in and add these middle dividers. 
originally, or kind of what I would have done before with my knowledge of woodworking, is I would have made sure that I incorporated these dividers into our first glue up, and that would have just made things just a little bit more complex. It's just another component that you have to make sure you add in. So the way that I did it here by making sure that I could add them in after the whole main structure was glued up just made the project a little bit easier and a little bit more relaxing. It took out a lot of the big challenges of putting this whole thing together. Now, as you can see with these, they're just very simple frames. We've got mortise and tendon frames with that fitted middle divider piece. Overall, again, nothing complex here. And I think that's an important thing to understand as you as you develop your woodworking skills is that it doesn't matter how big a project is, how complex it is. Generally speaking, most projects are gonna be built up of the fairly similar components each time. So our, our middle dividers here are built the exact same way as our side structures, as our doors are gonna be in just a minute here. All around, they're a very simple thing. The only addition to them is I just added in this little tenon to the top so that they match into the groove that I cut into those cross pieces. So these were very easy to fit up. You can see there that we're removing just a little bit of material from our front edge and our back edge and just leaving that small tongue that's about half the thickness. This is going to reference in and then we're just going to use a few number four screws to hold these dividers in place and that's going to lock our structure together making everything very solid. Now the one thing I do want to mention about these panels though, as I'm adding them in here, I did end up scratching the paint and kind of rubbing it down to that raw wood on a couple spots. But luckily, you know, that's not a big deal. I knew exactly, I knew that that was going to happen. So all I did is when I painted these pieces, I just slightly hit those areas with the airbrush, just adding a little bit of a very thin coat of paint over those areas that I dented or damaged. Uh, so that then there, you know, there's obviously not going to be visible wood there anymore. Even in the final assembly of this, I did end up scratching it in a few small places and all I did is I just put the paint back in the airbrush, gave it a light touch up and you couldn't even tell anymore. So that is the nice thing about paint is that it's very easy to cover up some of your smaller mistakes. For our lower dividers, this is where things again, I had to try and think on my feet because I didn't really have a good idea for what to do here. All I knew is that on the front edge, I needed gray, I needed vertically oriented grain so that it matched everything else, but I also needed to fill that space somehow so that my drawers had something to write against. And that's where I came up with this. So this is a piece of maple with a, po a couple pocket hole screws attached to a piece of ash. Now this worked just, again, just wonderfully. It was super easy to do. Uh, and I know a lot of people are not fans of pocket hole screws, neither am I, but when used in a proper application like this, this is, this is about the best use for pocket hole screws I can imagine because it's gonna allow for all the wood movement we're ever gonna need. And it's a nice solid joint for a piece that is not structural. That piece of ash on the front is just there to match the grain orientation of all of our other pieces and to take paint the same way as the rest of the structure of this thing. So again, overall, super easy way to add these in and it just worked out quite well. Now, you guys are probably getting bored of the fact that I keep trying new things on this project, but this is one of those projects where I just crammed in as many new things as I could possibly think of to try. So after trying cutting through joinery on those stretcher pieces with the mortiser, I figured, okay, what would happen if I did the same thing with the door pieces? Because for my door structures here, I'm only using one inch wide pieces. So using a normal tenon, which would be about a half inch long to fit inside that one inch piece, that's a very small tenon, doesn't have a whole lot of strength to it. So what I decided is by using through tenons, well, that gives me a ton of extra strength. The only trick is that I learned that I can't really do that kind of through joinery with my mortiser. It's not, it's not the cleanest method. Uh, and what I'd have to do in the future if I want to use this technique again is just make sure that I go back in and clean up those mortises with my chisels. That way I actually get a nice clean mortise. Here they were, they were came out pretty messy, but again, because I'm painting it, you can't really, you're never really going to notice it other than when it's in its raw wood form like it is right now. So then it was just a matter of putting the doors together and mounting them like you would mount any other door. So theoretically on a cabinet like this, it'd be very easy to just go on to our side structure and cut these same hinge mortises like I'm doing here because I'm just flush mounting the door. But the reason that I'm using the spacer piece is purely because of the human factor. If I was to try and cut those same mortises into the structure of the cabinet here, there's a very good chance I could screw something up. Whereas cutting them into that little, uh, that little spacer piece just means that if I screw it up, all I have to do is just make another spacer piece. I'm not risking damaging the actual structure of the cabinet. So I did actually end up offsetting the doors by about a 16th of an inch back. So it did make the spacer piece a little bit more necessary. But in my experience, anytime you're gonna be adding in doors with extruded brass hinges like I'm doing here, you always wanna use a small spacer piece. It's just gonna make your life a little bit easier. It makes lining up your mortises and all that, it just makes everything easier. And that's the important thing when you're doing a project like this is making things as easy on yourself as you possibly can. There's no point struggling when it's not all that necessary. So that's just one of those small tips that I've learned that I, you know, it's one of those things I always recommend it. You know, anytime anyone asks me why I add those strips in, it's just because it makes it just 
that much easier and takes away some of the risk of damaging, you know, the main part of the project. Now, like usual, when it comes to fitting up doors, you're not always going to get a perfect fit on the first try. So, I've, you know, kind of going back and forth, putting the doors on, taking them off, removing a little bit of material, got them to a nice fit with a nice even gap all the way around. Then the last part of this was adding in the shelf pin holes. Now, the shelf pin holes were one of the most stressful parts because I just had no idea how I was going to deal with lining these things up, mainly on our sides here. But luckily, I thought of this idea with just using my Craig jig, adding in those two offset pieces. And that just gave me a very easy time, you know, drilling these shelf and holes. And I had to use a normal brad point bit that was long enough to reach through all of these different pieces. But overall, it worked out just fine. Then we could go through and finally add paint to our last painted pieces and get ready to assemble this whole thing. With the structure of the cabinet all together, it was time to move on to the floating panels. Now I'm going to be making the floating panels out of alder because that's just what I happen to have in my shop. When I was planning out this project, I was kind of thinking cherry because I liked the dark tones I knew I could get out of it. Uh, but I didn't have enough cherry in the shop, but I had these two pieces of eight quarter alder which I figured would be just about perfect. So for these floating panels, we're going for a half inch thickness. So from that eight quarter piece of wood, I was able to get three pieces. Now what this means is that across all of our panels, three of the sections have a nice book match, two of them, then one section is just made up of two mismatched panels. Now luckily this isn't that big of a deal because we do eventually stain these panels so it does hide some of that, that book matching but overall it is nice that there is some book matching there and our outer side panels are book matched which is all that really matters. But overall I have to say that I was kind of surprised by this alder because I've never really worked with alder before. I think I've only ever bought one board of it uh, to test out to play around with and I didn't really think of any good uses for it because it's such a soft wood. But in the case of this cabinet where I want it to be a little bit more lightweight because I do plan on hanging it someday, using alder in these cases just helped lighten up the load a little bit. Plus it actually turned out really well. Now alder does not is a wood that does not stain very nicely. But even with this water-based stain that I was using, I was able to get pretty good results. So I started by using this walnut water-based stain and then topping it with some Trident to Original Oil and this gave it a really nice dark antique look. Then to mount these panels in the frame, we're gonna be using some white oak strips. Now this might not make sense right now, but it'll make sense as we go through this project because the whole idea here is we're contrasting these three different woods. So we've got the green painted wood, we've got this dark alder, then we're gonna have that natural white oak. So I wanted to use white oak for these trim pieces because I just thought it added in that extra level of detail and contrast and it really highlighted the fact that these panels were added in later on. I could have, if I wanted to kind of hide the fact that these panels were added in later, I could have made these pieces out of, out of ash, painted them green, and they would have blended in a little bit more. But I really like the idea of making them stand out and kind of frame these panels from the inside of the cabinet sections. So again, this is really just a decorative touch. You know, you can choose to do it either way you'd like. But for me, I really like making those stand out because it's a lot of extra work to put your panels in this way. And so I like to make sure that, you know, whoever is looking at this piece in the future knows how it was put together. You know, all there's no hidden secrets, anything like that. I, I like to make my pieces very transparent. I think that's the right way to look at it in that I, I like to make sure that people know how the joinery is done, how everything kind of makes sense. But with all these components together now, we can put everything together. You can see just how good this thing is starting to look with all these pieces coming together. And we're really starting to get the look that I was going for. Then we're on to the back panel. Now the back panel is probably my favorite part of this whole project. I uh, know that probably sounds bad to say, but this is my first time in a long time working with white oak. It's been months since I've worked with white oak. I don't know why. I have a lot of it sitting in my shop. I just haven't decided to do a project out of it for some reason. But white oak is one of my favorite woods, and this was exactly, you know, this reminded me exactly why. It's such an easy wood to work. It all, you always get good results from it. And overall, it was just really a really nice wood to work with. So this is a very simple panel, but the important thing here is that it needs to be very structurally sound because this, eventually when I do hang this cabinet, basically how it's gonna work is you're gonna mount this white oak panel to the wall, make sure it's all level and sitting where you want it, and then you'll basically hang the cabinet off of this white oak panel. So there'll be a few screws that go down from our top and bottom stretchers on the cabinet that'll tie into this panel and make it a nice solid structure. So it's really good important that this panel is as solid as can be. The other part of it is I want it to look good. So in the middle section here, I chose a very specific piece of white oak that I've been saving for quite a while now that has a lot of really interesting texture and detail. Some of the craziest grain I've ever seen in white oak. Then for our outer two panels, we went with a book matched pair. Now, one thing I should admit right off the bat here is when I glued these up, I did mess up my book match pair and they ended up putting one upside down and I'm just gonna have to live with that because the panel is now in its solid form and it kind of sucks. But to me, I'm probably the only one that is gonna ever notice it 
uh, but because these are buried inside of a cabinet anyway, you'd really have to have the two panels right next to each other and really be looking for the details to notice it. But for me, it'll be a little bit of an annoyance and a reminder in the future to pay attention to more what I'm doing. But again, overall, I was super happy with how this back panel came out because there's all the details coming together. And, and within the white oak itself, I tried to contrast the grains a little bit. So within the panels, I tried to use a little bit crazier, wilder cathedral style grains. For the actual frame, I went more for rifts on white oak. So we had very good straight grain with minimal ray flex in that. So overall, again, they just, they go so well together and this panel just came out way better than I ever could have expected. Then to make sure the panel stands out from the inside, I wanted to add in this bevel to just make sure that it pops. I wanted to make sure it was very separate from the green frame. So you can see here, everything fits up very tightly and that, that little bevel on the front just helps guide the panel in place so that again, when this is eventually hanging on the wall, it'll be very easy to mount up. Once I have this panel in place, then I can go through and add in our screws. Onto the more tedious part of the project, making the shelves. Now the shelves were a lot of work that was probably a little bit unnecessary, but I think it came out looking really cool in the end. So when I approached the shelves, I had two different choices. I could have made them white oak to kind of match the back panel or and you know the sides and all that kind of interior detail that we were doing, or I could make them alder to match our outside panels. And I decided to go with alder because I really liked that dark look. Again, I wanted the, the key eye feature of this cabinet to be that back panel as well as our drawer fronts that are gonna be made from white oak. All around, I wanted that white oak to really pop, so I didn't want these shelves to be taking away from that. So I figured by going with the alder and then staining it that nice dark brown, that would really just match in with the rest of the cabinet here. So to make these panels, they're very simple. I just took a bunch of eight quarter stock, sawed it down into strips, glued it up, and now we're just dealing with some nice simple panels. The one fancy part that I'm adding in here is some breadboard ends, because this is one of the things that I found with floating shelves in any of the cabinets that I've done, is I always like to add in breadboard ends because it just means that your shelf is gonna stay perfectly flat. You don't have to worry about it bowing or cupping, anything like that. It's just gonna stay nice and flat forever. Uh, and it's one of those things, it just means you don't have to worry about it. Now here, what I'm doing is I'm only doing a two pin breadboard end. So I'm gonna be gluing, putting glue in the center of this uh, single tenon and then both of these dowel holes will have the ability to move and expand as that middle panel moves and expands so they only have to deal with a little bit of movement over time but uh, there's just enough space in there that everything should be able to move around nice and freely so these panels did require just a little bit of fit up you can see in the background there that we're using these panels for both our floating shelves as well as the bottom panels of each of the sections and so just a little bit of fit up using the shooting board got these into a nice perfect fit all the way through then i can go through sand them up to 180 grit and then apply the walnut stain that we're using everywhere else Then for the drawers, this is where fate kind of took over. And it's a really funny way to put it, but that's actually just kind of how it goes sometimes. So in my original plans, I planned to make the drawer boxes out of alder. There's the same wood that I was gonna use to match the, uh, the floating panels and the shelves and all that because I really wanted the back panel of the cabin to be what catches your eye. I didn't really want the drawers to be, you know, I didn't want them to stand out. But as I, try, as I started going through the project here, I completely ran out of alder and the only option would have been for me to go and buy more. So that's where I started thinking about the white oak because really what I could do is I could make it so that the back panel caught your eye but also the drawer fronts because the drawer fronts are gonna be right in your face in that. So I had this piece of Rifts on White Oak that I've been saving for the longest time now and I didn't really know what to do with it because at some point in the lap, either at the sawmill, at the lumberyard, whatever, when somebody was planing it, they screwed up on the thickness and it, it's not thick enough to get a full three quarter inch piece out of. But it's absolutely perfect to get a half inch piece out of, which is what exactly what I was gonna use for these drawers. So for all of our drawer fronts, we're using a piece of beautifully Rifts on White Oak, which means we get nice straight grain without any uh, ray flex, anything like that in it. Then for the rest of the drawer box pieces, I just took them from a piece of eight quarter stock that I just re down into each of the half inch pieces. And for the joinery here, I decided to go with box joints because they just seemed really interesting. I, a lot of the time I'll just default to doing dovetails on drawers, especially with a drawer like this, I'd normally default to half blind dovetails, but I wanted something that would have a little bit more visual detail to it. Because we are on the front of this thing, we already have those, those plugs that are sticking out, we have the dowels sticking out all the way around. You know, we just have that extra detail in there. I figured that box joints would just help bring in a little bit more detail. Overall, that's just kind of what I was going for in this project is I want this thing to kind of assault your eyes. I want there to be a lot of stuff that catches your eyes, just adds visual interest to the whole piece. Again, that's just where box joints come in for me. 
The other thing that I really like about box joints is just the history of them. They come from a really interesting time in woodworking where machinery was becoming much more common in the shop so you could cut joinery like box joints, but people also did need to rely on joinery. You know, nails and that were not always the strongest thing. We couldn't really have any of the options to hold the box together. So you still, you know, if you wanted to make a good quality box, you know, all your ammo crates and that that went overseas in World War II, those were all made with box joints because they were absolutely the strongest joint we could possibly make at the time. And I just think that that is so cool. So they have that little bit of a history aspect to them as well as they just kind of look cool. So there's th those are the few factors why I really just am a fan of box joints and I'm planning to use them a lot more because again, for me, I just really like the look of it and I like having the option to do something that's not dovetails all the time. And finally, we have the table top or the topper for the cabinet. Now for this, I went with a book match piece of alder because why not? Uh, basically, the only reason I'm doing a book match here is just out of convenience. I had eight quarter alder and it just made sense to split a piece into two pieces to make up the width that I needed for the tabletop here. Now, again, this is one of those things that I joke about all the time that I most of the time when I'm book matching, I just book match for convenience more than anything. It's one of those things that I, it's always funny when I hear people talk about it is like this specialty thing. I just kind of do it for, you know, just kind of general purpose stuff, but it did work out really well here. It is nice that you can notice a little bit of a book match on this panel. Again, not super necessary, but it's a little bit of a nice touch. So all I'm doing here is I'm going super simple. Now this is kind of goes outside of my wheelhouse because on pretty much every tabletop I have ever done and the whole time I've been woodworking, I've always added breadboard ends. But on this project, the I, when I modeled it in SketchUp, I just thought the breadboard ends looked too busy. So I wanted to keep the, the top looking as simple as possible. So just going with a nice uh, full round over on the edge just made it look really good. Now this was a big learning opportunity too because this is the biggest piece of wood I've ever tried to stain with water-based stains. This project in, in itself is the first time I've ever used a water-based stain and this was a really painful learning opportunity for me because what I found out is that water-based stain is very finicky, very picky. So if you do one really good coat, you can get great results, but you have to do one really good coat. If you screw up anywhere and try to touch it up, you're gonna get pretty bad results. So it did take a little bit of back and forth, but eventually I was able to get a nice even-ish staining result. Again, this is the top of a cabinet. I'm not too concerned about it. Then of course, the last part of this project was applying tried and true original oil over everything. All the stain, painted and natural wood parts. This just gave it a nice soft, even finish all around. Moving into the final stage of this project, the assembly. So this was a really exciting point because at this stage, everything and all of our pieces are finished. Everything is just kind of sitting and spread out around the shop and it's time to finally put things together. So this is the first time in a while that I've tried to incorporate a clear material into the project. So in this case, I'm using some uh, just normal acrylic that I bought from Lowe's. Now this stuff is a little bit more on the expensive side compared to glass, which is I find kind of surprising, uh, but I did design these doors so that I could very easily someday go and get glass. Now the big difference between glass and acrylic is just mainly for one, the shatter resistance. So this is high impact acrylic, which means it could quite literally get punched and it's probably never gonna break, whereas glass would. The only downside to acrylic that I find anyway is that it just kind of looks different. It has a very different appearance compared to, you know, if you compare it directly to a piece of glass. Now, it's only a very subtle difference and it's not one of the things that I think a lot of people would notice. And the nice thing about working acrylic is again, you have that benefit of it's not gonna break on you as easily. So that's why I decided to use it on this project. But in the future, I'd probably lean more towards glass just for the look. But again, getting back to our final assembly here, everything was going together really nicely. I did notice last minute here that I did need some kind of catch or stop on the door. So I added in these little metal plates, stuck a magnet in the core of the door, and that just helps hold everything firmly in place so the doors aren't wobbling around. Now, if you guys made it this far in the video, I want to thank you for sticking around and just watching through. I do really appreciate those of you guys that make it this far into the video. And as always, if you really liked the video, if you want to see more of them, please remember to hit that like button because it really does help me out. And one thing I'd love to hear from you guys is just what you think of the painted wood. Is this something you'd be willing to try? You think it's complete travesty that I went through and painted this wood? Just what are your opinions on the painting of wood? Uh, because again, for me, this is something that is, it seems really wrong on one hand, but also seems really cool. And I just, I love the results that came from this. So yeah, just leave a comment down below. Let me know your thoughts. And I, you know, I really look forward to reading you guys' comments.
Anyway, back onto the project. At this point, we're doing this final assembly. This is where the project really took a turn from being something that was, you know, a good learning opportunity, a project that didn't go great, but still came out looking okay, to being something that I absolutely love. Now, the real trick here is that putting that coat of tried and true oil over everything seemed to really make a big difference. But overall, just seeing all these components come together and that final look just being exactly what I've always imagined, it was just amazing. So this this project very quickly got elevated from one that was just, you know, kind of a good one to being one of my top projects up there with the toolbox that I did recently, as well as the White Oak Bookmatch cabinet that I did about a year ago. These three projects together are just kind of my top tier ones and my absolute favorites. So this is, I was really excited with the way this one came out and I would literally love to hear what you guys think about it. But as we go into the glory shots here, I just want to say again, thank you guys for watching through the video. As always, I do hope you enjoyed it and I will see you in the next one. Thank you.